Hey, everybody. I have an interview coming up in just a minute with Dr. Donald DeGrazia from Wayne State University School of Medicine. And I wanted to do a little bit of an intro because I kind of screwed up the intro when I was talking to Don. Don is a brilliant guy. And what he does as his day job is way over my head. He works at the School of Medicine and doing some very advanced research on stroke victims and cell death, the National Institute of Health grants and all this stuff that I don't totally understand. He has a totally different approach to it, a, a nonlinear approach. Because, so he's tried to incorporate other models and other paradigms. But what you'll hear in this interview is that none of that stuff really matters. That's not what Don's about. What Don's about is really something much deeper to do with spirituality, the nature of consciousness, and what everything is really all about. He's an absolutely fabulous guest, one of my favorites, particularly because you won't hear about him in a lot of other places. You won't see a lot of interviews with him. He's not out there pumping books, he gives his books away for free, uh, and his thinking is just imaginative, unique, and he's not afraid to tell it like it is. So it's an interview I really enjoyed doing. I hope you enjoy listening to it. So we already told folks you're there at Wayne State University in the Department of Physiology, you're a professor, and uh, you've, but you have this secret life. You have a couple of secret lives, but one of your secret one of your secret lives is you're really into comics and you're wearing your Comic Con. What what t shirt are you wearing there? Uh, Black Panther. There we go. So that's that's the original Black Panther for all the Black Panther fans out there. So yeah, your comic cool. street page, you don't shy away from it. But <laughs> you also have this other secret life of a yogi. And I think that is so cool and, and we relate to each other because I'm a yogi and anyone's a yogi who says they're a yogi. You know, I, I had a guy. Effectively, yeah. Yeah. Well, it's, it's true. Cause I had a guy yeah. on the show recently and the guy's a total, in my opinion, total pretender in terms of this kind of deeply spiritual kind of what we are wise kind of guy. So, you know, we kind of got into it a little bit. And I said, yeah, I'm a yogi. And he goes, what, what kind of yogi? What, you know, what's your heritage? What, what weekend retreat did you go to kind of thing? And it's like, no, man, yogi is a state of mind. It's a philosophical shift. It's no one can be a yogi, right? There is, once you're a yogi, you're not a yogi anymore because it transcends that. But I, I kind of don't want to get too. No, that's, I agree with that completely. Yeah, no, it's, it's totally a state of mind. Yeah, that's one of the awkward things about when I talk about yoga because people ask me what, I do do I practice meditation and things like that like, I do yama and niyama that's what I do <laughs> I'm not advanced enough to do meditation yeah, explain that. it's the truth explain that's awesome it's that's the truth. awesome explain explain that well you know in both what is science and in yoga view of consciousness I define yama and niyama as the reading writing and arithmetic of yoga Right. right. So if you can't do reading, writing, and arithmetic. You can't do anything in the real world. And if you don't have yama and yama, you can't do yoga. Like for example, in yama, you have like celibacy is one of them, which is one of the more drastic ones. But being unselfish. Right. There's a whole bunch being non-harmful things like that. These make up the list of the yamas. And then the niyamas is like studying the spiritual scriptures, doing meditation, things like that. And, and what they really amount to is that yama is when the world itself loosens its grip on you, right? It's all designed to help you loosen your grip on the world because, you know, I mean, there's background to this. It's kind of hard to throw it in out of the blue. You have to, and this is what I think when you say you're just a yogi, anybody can be a yogi with a state of mind. Well, it starts at realizing that the world isn't what it seems to be. Right, and you start to question it, and you start to wonder what the hell is going on, what is this all about? And once you get to a certain level of sophistication, you realize the world is not really something you can grab onto, right? Doubt, you just start to feel doubt. You really do become skeptical, right? So your your title of skeptic is really quite apt to the whole enterprise because well, well, you know, it's it's interesting. I, I 
told the story many times, but it's one of those serendipitous, there are no coincidences, coincidence, but I chose the name Skeptico without fully appreciating what it was all about. And then I went and read about these Greek philosophers and Skeptikos was their philosophy. And I love the, the tagline. It was inquiry to perpetuate doubt. And I thought, wow, isn't that wonderful? Isn't that what it's always about? Because doubt, yes. doubt is, is spiritual. Yeah, it's the pathway into yoga. There's no question it's the pathway to yoga. So one of the things I talk about in Yoga View of Consciousness is how weird yoga is in our culture. Very just, it's not real yoga. Very strange. People sit around on mats and going to gyms and exercising and all that. I mean, it draws well, well, a little bit on Hatha yoga traditions, but it's not yoga. As, you know, well, yoga. Well, well, before you say it's, it's not yoga, because... <laughs> I, I get your point, but in a way, it 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 loses it too because I want to return back to the yama niyama thing because it always gets me when people talk, and maybe we'll talk later, like about you know Aleister Crowley and their Aleister Crowley fans, and I always want to say, yeah, but he was a despicable human being by every measure, by by the way he lived his life. No one would model their life or their spiritual path after this person, and to me that's the the yama niyama it becomes self-evident i mean if you're a creepy dude then you're not that's, doing yoga no matter it. It, yeah. what kind of poses you can do or no matter how long you can hold your breath or no matter what state you can achieve with it doesn't matter it's, it's all delusional if you don't have yama and niyama down so yeah like i said in the book basically to make it the same yama is loosening loosening the grip that the world has on you and then niyama is what do you replace it with which is a big part of it the very first step is doubt and questioning and then that's why part of niyama is studying the scriptures the hindu scriptures because they start to fill your mind with alternatives to the world and they start to you know ex explain to you what is beyond what's you know what's apparent to your senses and then that that becomes the start and then from there, it, it, it plays a role all the way up till the end. All the way up to the end. It becomes your shield that protects you from all of the delusional influences that you, that you encounter as you go deeper and deeper into the other practices. Well, I wanted to, uh, I wanted to draw people's attention to two of your excellent books. You've written several. These books are, are, are amazing. A lot of them grew out of your blog and a series of blog posts that you've done. You've made these books available for free on your website, dondeg.com. That's D-O-N-D-E-G.com. We'll have a link in the show notes. And we're kind of pulling from two of those books. One, what is science? And we did an interview a few years ago on that that's really brilliant in terms of what you've done in that book. And I want to reference that again in a minute. And the second is the yogic view of consciousness that you're alluding to, where you really take a scholar's approach to understanding the yoga sutras and breaking them down and analyzing them from a bunch of different ways. And you've been alluding to that, talking about that a little bit right now, but I'd like you to maybe talk a little bit about, first of all, the chain of consciousness concept that you bring to this in order to help people understand a yogic view of what is consciousness. And then you have a rather fascinating diagram in the book as well that, that kind of shows a, a projector and then a, 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 the cave of consciousness and Immanuel Kant's transcendent consciousness and the screen and you can maybe talk people through that who are listening, who can't see it. But can you tackle those two, the chain of consciousness and this well, diagram? Let's do, the, let's do the diagram first, because that's the core of the book. The whole book is based on that. And before we get too deep into it, one of the issues is, um, I don't know if I would call it scholarly per se, it's, you know, I kind of address that in my introduction. It approaches whatever needs needs to be right so sometimes 
it's kind of scholarly, but sometimes it's very sarcastic and even sardonic. And sometimes I think it's funny. You know, I laugh at my own joke, though maybe it's nerdy. I don't know. So there's yeah, a whole but but Don, you're you're monopoly. Of, whenever you talk, Don, you're talking at a pretty freaking high level intellectually for most people. So it's great that you can you know, bring it down with the self-deprecating humor and all the rest of that. But I want, I want people to know that that's why I wanted them to get a little bit of an introduction to who you are, a serious heavyweight guy in terms of intellectually, and that comes through. So the fact that you can make it readable, great, but I'm sorry, go ahead. Let, let's okay. talk about that. Diet. So anyway, yeah, that graphic that is the core of the book. I mean, that came from me trying to understand Vanderloo's book, The Conquest of Illusion. And he basically discusses that um, idea. And it, over the years, it's kind of, <clears throat> that's the way I've been able to model it. And this is essentially the structure of what we are right here. It's, and it, it's a really amazing thing because it reconciles so much of Western philosophy. It's, it's subsumed within this diagram. And it also unites Western and Eastern philosophy. And the idea basically is that it, it's, in large measure, um, made out of, based on the Plato's Allegory of the Day, which I presume especially your listeners are familiar with. Please go like, over it. Please go over it one more time, because I had to hear it five times before I really got it anyway. What, Plato's Allegory? Yeah, Pla Plato's yeah. Allegory. Give, give people the basics on it. Right. So he talked about these prisoners who are chained with their um, facing a cave wall. And then behind them, into the entrance of the cave, you know, light came through and they saw shadows moving on the wall. And these prisoners concocted a whole cosmology, basically, based on the way the shadows moved on the wall, because that's all they knew was the shadow. And in the, in the allegory, one of the prisoners breaks free of his chains and he turns around and sees that the shadows were just shadows and that there's actually a world outside of the cave. And, you know, initially he's completely dumbfounded and doesn't have any ability to interpret. You know, he's like blinded by the light that's coming through the entrance of the cave, but eventually he adapts and, and uh, that's, you know, now experiencing the real world. And then the clincher is he comes back to tell the people in the cave that these are just shadows. None of this is real. And they all reject him. They think he's insane. So it's, it's a beautiful metaphor for a million things, but it provides a model of the nature of our mind. And so the, basically the idea is, is that our mind is like a balloon and there's no outside. There's only the inside. There's no outside to it. And the front surface of the balloon is the screen. And this is our direct, immediate, everyday awareness, our consciousness, our sensory perceptions, our awareness of the world, our thoughts, our emotions. That's all the stuff that everything that we're consciously aware of is the screen of consciousness. But then the idea of the cave in the model here is that the screen itself, what appears on the screen is caused by stuff inside the cave, which in the West we call our subconscious or unconscious mind, right? And it's kind of like the idea in yoga, they use the metaphor of a body of water where the surface of the water is our surface consciousness. And then the things, the currents and eddies underneath the water are what cause the waves on the surface. And then the uh, main element of this, though, is that all the way at the very bottom of the cave, at the very center of it, there's this hole. And through this hole comes this light. And that's all metaphorical. What comes through the hole is consciousness itself. And this, then, is a model of what yoga can do. And the idea of what yoga is is freeing yourself, yourself. turning around from that screen, moving through the cave, finding that hole that consciousness comes through, passing through that hole. So in the, the diagram here, the hole is called the Bindu, which is the, the term that comes out of Kashmiri Shivism. Uh, you know, that's from around 900 AD. Very sophisticated way to think. And you pass through the Bindu, and bingo, you enter the real world, the absolute. That's the analog of, of um, leaving the cave, Plato's cave. And you enter the real world, the world of reality, which there's a number of different names for it. In Hinduism, they tend to call it Brahman. 
or in throughout the book, I call it the absolute because that's probably the best term or infinity is another good term to use. Or God, all of them are synonymous. And so this is an idea of the nature of what we are. It, it's a so, model based on yoga, based on the teachings of yoga and how and it explains how yoga works. Yeah, touch on Immanuel Kant because I think there's an interesting connection there. He's not a yogi and he's another guy who's saying the same thing in a way that maybe we can better understand it. Yeah, through his intellect, he understood. So one of the things, this is something actually, I teach an advanced neurophysiology course. I'll be doing it again this year. And one of the things I do is I introduce the students to the, uh, these philosophical concepts like idealism and materialism and dualism and the different philosophical viewpoints of the mind because they're all basically trained to be materialists without knowing it. And so basically what Kant did, he was an idealist. And idealism says that the world exists in our mind, that there is no world outside of our mind. And it really, it's the, actually the most logical thing because what we perceive with our senses, we, we understand it only as through our mind. It's all purely mental. The world that we perceive is purely mental. Now we've talked about that a bunch on this, on this show, but I want to go back and just hit that point one more time. Because on one hand, it's so self-evident that we kind of have a natural way of either brushing past it or recall it, recoiling from it. But what you're saying is everything we could possibly experience is experienced in our mind. Yes, absolutely. And you're right. It's just so unbelievably obvious. You, you, once you get it, the light bulb goes on and you're just like, oh my God, how could it be otherwise? Or you recoil from it because it's just so alien to you on first hearing. And, you know, if you have that reaction over time, you'll initially resolve yourself to it because there's no way out of it. This no, is, but, but hold on. No, no, we, we, no, absolutely not true, right? There's all these folks running around measuring stuff, uh, believing that the reality that they're experiencing is real. They are not thinking well, about those, that. Those people the light never went on. They never got it. They never understood the, what was being said. So, so let's make sure we understand as I'm kind of ranting on there. I mean, how does not fully realizing that or accepting it manifest itself in the world that we live in. And in particular, we can talk about science if you want. How does yeah, it well, Science is a great example of it. Yeah, it's basically, um, Vanderloo called it sense realism or primitive sense realism. Other people use that term too. So where you perceive the world with your senses and you believe that it is out there, outside of you. Right. So the stuff that you see on the screen, the world, the, the trees, the clouds, the other people, the planets, the stars, all that. That's, that's sense realism. And you believe that it is exactly as it appears in your awareness. And you completely ignore the fact that your awareness is containing those things. Those things exist only in your awareness. Right? Well, what I introduce as a way of kind of jumpstarting that whole thing is the um, the shut up and calculate thing, right? <clears throat> so it's in the early 19th. Well, you know, shut up and calculate, actually, in the intervening time since we've been to, you know, since the last time I talked to you, I've come to appreciate that in a way that attitude is kind of humbling itself before what we're talking about, right? Because that comes yes. out of quantum mechanics, and quantum yes. mechanics presents an un comprehensible picture of the world. It's completely inconsistent with yes. what we perceive. And so the logic is, hey, um, we don't know everything. Our senses are not everything. And whatever's going on, this works. And so just shut up and calculate. Well, well I, agree with, I agree with part of that. But if they made that first philosophical uh, uh, leap or they became grounded in it, then I could agree with you. If they fully embrace the, we really don't know what the hell is going on. But well, I, What I would say to that is I think the people that invented that viewpoint did that. Like, for example, Niels Bohr. The more I've learned about Niels Bohr. Oh, yeah. But not Richard was, Feynman. Not Richard Feynman. I don't, think, I don't think Richard Feynman really got that at, at that level. 
I mean, he, because. No, but then what happened is it just became a ritual and people mindlessly repeated it. Exactly. And then it just became another institution, kind of like institutionalized religion. There's, there's two problems with shut up and calculate. One, as you just described, it can, it can mesmerize you into forgetting the philosophical quandary that you were attempting to get out of with the whole thing. And number two, along the lines that you've kind of talked about too, you can become romanced with the tools that it creates. So well, you know, right now, right now we're like right directly over the center of a concept I used throughout the whole book as one of my snide, sardonic viewpoints of what I call philosophical pygmies. And that in particular is meant to refer to modern physics, right? I love modern physics. I think it's one of the greatest contributions of Western science. And what's happened over the centuries is generated a large part of the population out there right now, particularly with well, the layman oriented stuff, they're philosophical pygmies. They're not Einstein, they're not Schrodinger, they're not Bohr, they're not Newton, they're not even Galileo. Those guys were all driven by really great stuff. And one of the things I do in the book is I contrast Herman Weil, who was, in my opinion, one of the last really great physicists, because, I mean, he was super towering. He was better than Einstein, better than Schrodinger, because he mixed philosophy, religion, math and science and to him the beautiful harmony of mathematical physics proved that god created everything when was the last time you heard prominent important physicists say that well how about this how about just contrasting what you just said with you know one of our science elites stephen hawkins who says philosophy is dead right, That's right. So, so, philosophical pygmies right they're this big with respect to well, well he, isn't, he isn't it's even he isn't, to the tradition of science. Yeah. Yeah, I don't you even know. know if he's a pygmy anymore when he says philosophy is dead. He's kind of so arrogant. Yeah, well. And arrogance is a sign of being ignorant. And that's all it is. And so I make I have no compunctions, I pull no punches, I, I smack the philosophical pygmies around every chance I can because they deserve it. They're stupid. And, you know, one of the, I've spent a lot of time thinking about this. How did this degeneration come about? And it relates to a lot of changes in the, you know, that really took off in the 20s and 30s. With um, you see it in Cubist art, you see it in postmodern philosophy. There was just this general generation. And if you look at the root, where did that whole thing come from? I honestly believe, and I say this in my writings, it came from Kant. Because after Kant, there was nothing left to be said. The world presents itself, it is in our mind. We can make the assumption that there's something outside there putting the presentation in our mind, but that's the transcendental. We'll never know. It's inaccessible because the only way we can know is through our mind. I mean, he was, uh, the, he was the turning point in Western philosophy. There's no question. And he formulated, he, when, when did he write? His, his great book, I think it was published in 1774, somewhere around there, very close to when the American Revolution happened. And it was a revolution in Western thinking. So it was kind of accordant with the times. And in that, he said that we can only hypothesize that a real world exists. We can never know it for real because that world is outside of our mind. And all we can know is what is in our mind. So how can we know? It's literally a contradiction to think that you can know something that's outside your mind, inside your mind. You just, it makes no sense. It's a contradiction. And so that thing outside of our mind that we can never know, he called the transcendental. And so what, what's interesting and in how it ties into yoga is yoga is the method to not um, know the transcendental, but to be the transcendental. Yoga teaches you how to escape this trap that can't identified of being in our mind, and it allows us to enter the transcendental and to be the transcendental. That, they call it various things, nirvana, in yoga, Sutras is called Kaivalya, which means alone. It's the one, the one that's alone, which is, a, you know, you can think of that in terms of God or however you want to say it. Okay, and great. Let's, let's leave that at there because I'm already, I'm going to, I got a million things I'd love to talk to you about. Talk to this, Don. Talk to this because I love the way you lay out and lay bare 
academia as it's currently misunderstood, science is naive and humanities are bitter. And I think that's really kind of a cool thing to talk about. Both, because both aspects of it, because if you don't understand both, you, you don't understand the dilemma. No, that's right. Well, you know, that idea comes from the writings of an author from the 1950s named C.P. Snow, who was an engineer who wrote about a thing called the two cultures that even by the 50s had become very apparent. On one hand, you had the sciences and their worldview, and then you had the humanities who were completely divorced from the sciences. So academia itself became divided along these lines, and they never communicated with each other. And if you trace this backward, again, it's my assertion that the division started with Kant. Kant was the, the turning point of all of this, because prior, you know, science used to be called natural philosophy. And through the 16 and 1700s, most scientists were not only highly religious, but they were very adept in philosophy. They contributed to philosophy. Look at Leibniz. Leibniz is a great example. He contributed so much to philosophy and science. Newton did too in his own way, although he was much inferior to Leibniz, which I always have to slide in there because I'm a pro-Leibniz guy. But by the time of Kant, they had separated. And with Kant's idealism, the humanities now became totally inward focused. Right, there was no, it was all just human creation, period. And then the sciences literally just ignored Kant. Let me fast forward a bit because one of the ways that I think what you're saying will resonate with people is the word arrogance that you just used a minute ago, or ignorance when it comes to the part of science. And I like the way that you put it is it's not so much that they've created this obviously flawed model of reality being outside, but that they've turned it into an echo chamber where they really believe this shit themselves, this bullshit, and it becomes a dogma. So their naivete was getting past the shut up and calculate, which is useful for building certain things, but then turning it into a religion, scientism, and saying it's really true. But the way you contrast that, I love the way that you say, humanities are bitter because so the humanities sit over there and they say well as you point out well at least we understand that there is such a thing as culture society it's human society. beings but and idealism right i mean the ideal of philosophy is now squarely in the humanities it's no longer part of science and so yeah these people they've been pushed out of the center because through most of Western history, the humanities were the center, right? The study of language, the study of arts, the study of philosophy, and science was just a side branch. And then over but, the but now we say, we say, well, hey, uh, philosophy department, where's your freaking iPhone? Where's your iPhone? Show me your iPhone. You haven't, you haven't given me anything, so That's they're right. better. That's right. Yeah. And, you know, and a scientist just has an attitude of, I don't care what you have to say. You walk off the roof and you'll, gravity will pull you to the ground and kill you just like it will everybody else, so shut up. That's kind of the scientist attitude, and it, it has. It's made humanities very bitter because they're no longer the center of the action in the world, right? Our whole world is driven by science and technology now. And so these people, what have they done? They've, they've lost their mind. They've literally gone insane. And you can see this beginning at the turn of the century with um, Russell. And, uh, yeah, Bertrand Russell. To me, he's the beginning of the insanity of philosophy. That guy, I just, I really don't like him very much. And he failed at everything he did. He failed at the math he made up. He was a bad philosopher. He basically, he thought he, he, he literally just asserted that idealism is wrong. Because up to the, around, you know, the year um, 1900, idealism dominated philosophy. Because it's inarguable. If you get it, then you can't argue with idealism. But Richard Russell just said, there's some quote of him that I read where he said, I was just so, felt so liberated to run through the green grass of the field, realizing that green grass is real. It's like, what is this? It's emotionalism. It's like, it's this stupid emotionalism. And it, it gave, it, it, the dam broke, and just stupidity became synonymous with philosophy. And then you had postmodernism, structuralism, philosophies that dominated up till now, where it's just absurd beyond belief, you know. What, what philosophy has become is a joke. It's, it's a, a, a real insult. If the scientists are an insult to their heritage, the philosophy 
to modern philosophy is an even bigger insult to the charity. And we're just in a mess right now. It's like a Gordian knot, and it just needs to be exploded, really. And on a, on a certain level, though, this is the beauty of, of putting all this in the context of yoga, because when you learn yoga, you just this again comes back to the yama and niyama. This is just the way of the world. It's always rocking back and forth. There's always stuff erupting and blowing up and going round and round, and that's just the way of the world. And yoga is about, you know, turning away from that, looking in, trying to find that center, trying to find the source of all of this stuff, and not, you, you just turn your back away from that for a while. That's part of yoga. You just turn your back from it. And that's common, you know. You know, you did a nice rundown there of some of the problems with science. I wanted to bring to your attention Henry Bauer, who you know, and in, in before the show, you're going, oh, we're going to talk a little bit about Henry Bauer. I love Henry. I love Henry. He's a great man. I think he's, I think he's quite a special guy. And one of the things that I like about his explanation for the dilemma that we find ourselves in with regard to science is he explains it from a market forces standpoint. And I wonder if you had any thoughts on that, especially since you're right in the middle of that and live that on a day-to-day -day basis. And that is, so Henry's basic argument is, hey, in the 1950s, it's after World War II, so science has been instrumental in helping us win the war, if you will. So we're gonna plow all this money into science and what we wind up is an what we wind up with is an oversupply of scientists. Well, you have that angle, but you know, Henry's got this viewpoint that he, like a sociological view, starts at the very earliest days of science up till now, and the variable he focuses on is conflict of interest, right? So in the earliest days, like we mentioned Leibniz and Newton and those guys, they just did science because it came out of them. They were natural, right? The way Mozart made music, Leibniz, Galileo, Kepler, all these earlier scientists that came out of them. They were natural. And then by the 1800s, it had started to become institutionalized. And that's with the rise of the universities and universities sponsoring science. And then that led to, you know, because look at Einstein, right? I mean, that was the whole goal to get into a university. He had to work in a patent office for a while before he could actually get a real job as a university professor, right? That takes us up to 1900. And then with all their effort, and the invention of the atomic bomb, it all, and governments took a huge interest in it and it became sponsored by the government. And, and then what you're seeing is this increasing conflict of interest. So when you're a university professor, it's, a, it's an idea of keeping your job. You have to do science to keep your job, right? But then they're, they're still copacetic, right? There's an economic interest, but you still, you're going to lose your job if you lose your credibility, so you still want to do good science. But when it became a government-sponsored thing and highly, highly commercialized, that's when the conflict of interest became negative, very negative, where you would literally just cheat, right? You'd just cheat and make, or you would get into it solely to make money, and you no longer were a natural scientist at all. You didn't care. And well, I mean, those are, th there's probably some kind of continuum there because... Yeah, it's a, it is, well, it is. It's, it's exactly how he explains it. It's a historical continuum that's gotten worse and worse over time. And today now, it's, uh, you know, that's, that's the big part of it. And then coupled with what you just said about the demographics of this huge population of people that are all competing to keep their jobs, you know, this is reflected in where we started with NIH grants. Right? I do see this in my everyday life. So the getting an NIH grant is extraordinarily competitive and it is much, much more about keeping your job and moving up the promotional ladder than it is about doing good science. Okay, so part of that, so once after I got tenured and I was able to really kick back and start to think about this and devise the theory that I explained to you earlier, now I, I, I submitted that to NIH two years ago and it got strongly rejected i mean insultingly rejected which is shocking it was so far afield from the mainstream and so at that point you see that it becomes threatening to these other people because i'm offering a completely alternative viewpoint that will wipe out their way of thinking and they've spent their whole career studying this alphabet soup molecule or this alphabet soup molecule 
trying to, you know, say this is why cells die after a stroke, for example. And, you know, so there is a tremendous amount of social inertia and resistance. And the interesting thing, too, about it is it's all very much instinctive, right? Animals instinctively protect their territory. This is not like if you had humanities people where they've read a lot of philosophy and social science and they know the factors that are working here. These are just people working from gut instinct to protect their turf, right? But if we can interject a little bit of realism in the form of conspiracy and conspiratorial forces, this gives greater and greater power to the people who are one level up the control system, right? So if I, if I have all the rats running through the mazes just the, just the way that I want, and I'm the one who has the cheese, man, I have more and more power as there are more and more well, rats. Going there, I mean, one of the ways, you know, to fill that in with specific detail. So uh, NIH grants, that's tax money, right? The funnels through the federal government. We all pay. Everybody in the country pays their federal taxes. It goes in, part of that goes in the federal budget to the NIH, $30 billion a year of federal money, in fact. And then that gets divvied up between the administrative costs and giving out grants. And so those grants are federal, they're, they're subsidized by the whole society, but the main beneficiaries of it are the biotech industry and the pharmaceutical companies, right? Because who cares? Do you and your grandma care about my research? No, only companies that are going to make drugs or make medical devices. So you've got big companies like Fisher and Sigma and um, it's just giants. Suppliers, and then it's also this. Oh, self- hold on, of course, me and my grandmother care about your research. Research. The point really is that we are not represented in that on, at the table in terms of letting our having our force having our voice be heard because that's the way that that. Yeah, I think that's that's probably true. Yeah, I mean, but what you care about is the result, right? You don't care about the details. You just want the result. You want, you know, something that when somebody has a stroke that they get better instead of as it is now where they just, nothing happens. They just have a stroke and their brain dies. So what is the future for your research? You are going forward, right? Oh, yeah. I've started to apply. I actually just submitted to a, a foundation. I've been submitting to foundation, hoping that maybe we can find more open-minded Stuff there. I'm, I'm not super optimistic. Mean, I'm realistic. I don't want to say I'm not optimistic. I'm just realistic about it. Hey, let's, somehow, let's jump over. Somehow, though, karma has kept it where we have been able to slowly but surely progress this program. It's been, and it is pretty wild. We're like getting to this almost shut up and calculate level. Yep. The theory has advanced much, the mathematics. In fact, we just wrote a paper and submitted it to a physics journal, and they did not outright reject it. They basically just said, we don't really understand why this is important. You know, if you could explain to us, then we would reconsider. So that's, that's actually a very optimistic review. That's progress. Right? <laughs> yeah, it is progress. So, you know, that's with the theory. And the theory itself is um, pretty shocking. And something that I was going to say earlier when we were talking about this, but, you know, one of the big differences between what we're doing and the, the mainstream way, the mainstream way of doing it is it's always the same pattern. You, you predict that some chemical inside the cell is causing the death, and so you try to find some drug that it stops that chemical from doing whatever they think it's doing, right? But what with our mathematical theory, we've already begun to be able to envision machines. You could create whole new technologies that you could create it's kind of a, maybe like an MRI machine or something like that, but you take it and you put the stroke patient in it, you would be able to identify the extent of their stroke and calculate the therapy and apply it using light or something like light or radiation, not a drug at all. And so this is, um, you know. Help me out with this one, Don. When you get consciousness wrong, now, we've talked a lot about science, and some people call it science bashing. I, I don't consider it that way. I think it's, uh, let's see. I wrote a book a couple of years ago, Why Science is Wrong About Almost Everything. And the basic premise was that if you get consciousness wrong in the way you're describing it, then it's hard really to get much of anything right. Yep. Talk about I read that. A great book, Alex. Oh, my, thanks. My bullet doors, but. <laughs> 
Thank you. So make sure you put that on your show. I will. I absolutely will. But to expound on that point, because it's frustrating for me to have to explain to people, even people I really like and respect, like Rupert Sheldrick, you know, Cambridge biologist, but just recoil again at the idea that science is wrong about almost everything. No, wait, wait, they're, they're right about lasers. They're, they're right about, uh, the wrong about all of it. You're right. You're right. See, and it comes back to Kant. See, we can only go back to Kant because Kant said it. Everything that appears to be outside of us is actually in our mind. So if we don't understand how our mind works, we really don't understand how those things work. And this is why we're faced with this shut up and calculate paradox quantum mechanics, because now all of a sudden we're confronted, ever since the quantum mechanics in the 1930s, we've been confronted with the fact that whatever this transcendental thing is that Kant was talking about, it is nothing at all like what our senses perceive the world to be. Our senses are perceiving some very narrow, very narrow window into what it really is. And so that right there should cause everybody to be highly um, skeptical about realism as a viewpoint. Let's, yeah, let's sure. pound on that a little bit further, and I want to draw people's attention to some of your writings. Uh, one is an excellent article you wrote for Edge Magazine, which is a publication of the Journal for Scientific Exploration, and you wrote an article about beyond neuroscience. You're really saying all the same things, but you it's interesting that when you apply it to a different field like neuroscience and you say, hey, Beware of all those pretty pictures that you see on your fMRI because you may be interpreting them differently than they really are. It helps people, I guess, maybe get a little bit closer to what you're really talking about here. So if you can, break that down uh, in terms of beyond neuroscience because we sure do love neuroscience. Sure. So, okay. Um, first thing to say is that article was written as it's almost a little precursor of the book, of Yogic View of Consciousness. It was a follow-up to that SSE talk I gave that's up on the internet, which also was a precursor to the book. So the it's book, up on the internet, but I just had to repost it because you had it like unlisted or private or something like that. No one no. could find it. I downloaded it and re-uploaded it, and we'll talk about oh, really? it. In that's oh, why wow. no one could find it. Oh, wow. I didn't, I didn't think it was private. Anyway, um, so yeah, it all comes back to Kant, right? So everything that we perceive with our senses, the idea is if you assume that the transcendental, there is something outside of our mind, if you make that assumption, you can't assume that whatever that is has the same form as it takes in our mind, right? So when we perceive something in our mind, this, I actually address this in Yoga View of Consciousness, and I show as an example a holograph. Okay, so a holograph, if you've seen a 3D holograph, right? It looks like something, you know, Louis Armstrong playing his, his trombone or whatever in 3D. But if you look at the holographic plate that stores that, it just looks like um, this weird kind of semi-beautiful pattern that has nothing to do with it. It's just this weird abstract pattern stored on the holographic plate. And But then if you do certain manipulation to that holographic plate, it produces holograph of Louis Armstrong, right? And so that's the, a, a good metaphor to try to understand the link between the, the transcendental and the actual appearances in our mind. So we see Louis Armstrong in our mind, but in the real world of the transcendental, it's more like this abstract thing that we're only getting a certain angle or a limited concept of. So, but now introduce neuroscience, because what I hear you saying is neuroscience takes the joke and extends it one level further. Well, and says, I mean, think about says, no, it. We can take a, they say, no, Don, we, can, we have this nice picture here of your mind. Just look at, on it, look at it on the computer screen, and that is your mind. That's not just your brain. That is your mind. That is well, conscious. Don't forget, I'm highly, I have a PhD in this stuff, so if you want to go there, I mean... You're, you're like asking for a fight. What I want you to try and do for folks is, is connect them to why it's so attractive to look at those fMRIs, why it's so alluring, and why it's complete nonsense. 
Well, yeah, so in this advanced neuro course, I give a lecture on brain blood flow and the lack of blood flow, which is ischemia, which I'm gonna prove. But their exercise is they have to criticize, I give them some highly detailed brain anatomy uh, literature to read, and they have to explain why the fMRIs are so unbelievably crude and what their fundamental flaw is. And the flaw itself is that there's this concept called block design or subtraction design. And the idea being that um, here's a standard fMRI experimental design where let's say you want to study what parts of the brain are involved with reading. So what you'll do is you'll put somebody in the fMRI machine and you'll show them just images that don't have words. And that'll activate the eyes and the visual parts of the brain. And then you'll show them just word, which activates the eyes and the visual parts of the brain, plus the language part. And they'll take the scan they get in the first instance, which is just visual activation, and subtract that from visual plus language activation. And then the difference they get is, they then say those are the language parts of the brain. And once in a while it kind of works, but in general it does not work. And the reason it does not work goes back to this whole thing of nonlinear. See, when you just add two things together, they're assuming they're linear. And when you subtract them, they're assuming they're just, you're linearly adding language to the other. So you can't do that. That's, that's Why another. can't you do that? Why can't you do that? Break that well, down. Because the system is inherently nonlinear. That's why. But here's the even better thing. So somewhere around 2002, 2003-ish. Hold on. I, I, I back up there one second. The system is inherently nonlinear. Nonlinear means that when you can't just add things together, they don't just simply, it's not two plus two equals four. It's more like you got this item and you add this item to it. And now it's like, instead of twice the effect, you get four times the effect. So why are, why is that fMRI? I don't want to belabor this. Why is that fMRI inherently nonlinear? Explain that. For well, the me. fMRI, fMRI measures blood flow in the brain. Okay, it's measuring the flow of blood. And first off, and this is another part of the exercise, the question of how using the neurons links to blood flow, that's not been solved. There's a several theories about it, and the students are expected to learn those. Those are, they, they have the form of this ABC kind of thing. You gotta learn these different molecules that interact and so forth. And that itself is flawed because that assumes a linear sequence of events at the cellular level. And, you know, part of the anatomy, I have them, there's actually some really good people in the field that write very intelligent articles, and I have them read one that, like, this is an amazing thing that even blows me away. If you take one square millimeter of brain tissue, it has something like close to a million neurons in it, some several kilometers of axon and dendrite material, it's just unbelievably densely packed. And that unit, one square millimeter is a typical voxel of current MRI technology. So you're averaging across that whole thing, across a million neurons. What the, what does that mean? Right, at least temperature, we understand theoretically because it's just molecules beating off stuff. But when you've got a million neurons interacting and you're averaging across all of that, what does that mean? So we can return to your analogy about the cell and the cell is a city. And we yep. can't, so we can say, well, that city is no more, or we can say that city is still functioning. But if you were inside the city, it would make a really big difference if the city up and moved to another place, or if it got hit by an atomic bomb, or if various things, or it got hit by uh, some plague or something like that. All those things would be very different. And, and, yeah, and, and so there's an analogy here, like with the fMRI, too. Well, in the right? case of MRI, we got a million cells in that volume of one voxel, one unit of that image. So now we're dealing with a million cities. What, what happens when you have a million cities interacting? And you're getting this some signal coming out that, in fact, has to do with the magnetization properties of blood. That's the basis of uh, fMRI signal, right? We have hemoglobin, and that's a, a magnetic substance in our body, and you're altering the fMRI shoots a magnetic wave and, and alters its magnetization, and you're getting this magnetic signal back out of the, the, the um, machine, right? So what the hell, right? So we're talking about this unit of a million things, and you shot this big magnetic pulse into it, or actually radio frequency that changes the magnetization, then you get the magnetic output, and yeah, it really, it's, 
it's literally voodoo. It's literally voodoo. And if the students don't recognize that, they get a very bad grade on my exercise. Propaganda, it's a matter of just like logically going through this because if you're a scientist and you're really trying to reveal the mechanism of something, that's your goal, right? You can't just do fluffy arm waving stuff. And so it's it's a very strict, strong exercise and they need to explain how and the other thing too, those are hold on, jump jump in there for a minute and, and return to a point because it's it's nice to kind of really fully understand the, the pluses and the minuses because it can be useful in some situations. But it's again returning to the shut up and calculate thing. Let's not forget what we're assuming well, when we when we use that. So well, I, I, fMRI is pretty good for diagnosing certain types of medical illnesses. That's the one thing that you can say. There's clear places where you get macroscopic damage in the brain that you can detect with that technology, which is really good for diagnostic purposes. Well, well here's another one I'd throw at you because I'd love to get your comment on it because in my world and in the people I talk to, the other thing that's kind of interesting about fMRI that's happened lately is go give somebody psilocybin and measure, do an fMRI before, and then do an fMRI under psilocybin. And everything we think we know about neuroscience would say, wow, you're having this intense experience. Your fMRI is going to be lit up. There's going to be all this blood flow all over the place because you're having this exceptional experience. And what they find, not surprising to a yogi like you, is the opposite. They find the shutting down of the filters of consciousness, I'm injecting that in, that's an assumption, but there's finding a shutting down of certain areas that cause this increased awareness. So there's a tool there, we're getting data, but the data doesn't fit our ontology, so we kind of reinterpret it in a different way. What do you think about some of that research from David Nutt in the UK and, and other folks like that? Well, one thing that, um I wanted to, I'm not going to directly answer that right away, but I wanted to circle back to something I was going to say about the limitations of the fMRI technology is that, right, we talked about the linear block design subtraction method. You just described this a block design experiment, right, with psilocybin and without. Scan them, you subtract, and you get the difference, right? You literally just designed a, or described a subtraction design experiment. Well, I started to say this, and around 2003 or so, it was discovered that under normal conditions, when you're just sitting there totally doing nothing, relaxing, there's certain regions of the brain that are highly active, okay? and it's called the default network. That's what it is now. There's this whole literature out there now about the default network, and this explained why often what would happen in these subtraction designs is that you would, you know, going back to our simple visual language example, you would do the subtraction and you'd find like some areas would go way down, right? You're, you're looking for the areas that are active in word recognition, but you see a bunch of er obscure areas that you would never think had anything to do with language. You see them go down, right? And what a lot of that now can be pinned to the fact that there's this default network that runs. And what happens is when we engage in specific tasks, like say reading or playing, moving our muscles, or listening to music, or listening to language, specific type tasks, that alters the behavior of the default network. It slows the default network down and it backs up, say, the language areas, or what have you. And so that had been in the going on all along and nobody knew it, right? All this fMRI data from pre-2003-ish is, you gotta just take with a real grain of salt how they interpret it because they didn't know about the, the default network that just runs naturally and the default network now is believed to um, be related to internal states like daydreaming um, just thinking to yourself things that happen in quiet state so what you're talking about about the psilocybin result is suggesting that, I mean it's basically activating the default network and suppressing other specific parts of the brain that allow us to engage with the world Right, so that result that you described to me actually, just on hearing it for the first time, makes sense because I haven't seen that particular study. So here's where I thought we'd go next, and it's this idea of 
kind of looking at the extremes, which I think are always advisable in, in, sci in science is to look at the anomalies, right? Because we get really comfortable with our theories and then we, we, we can never prove anything in science, but it is pretty cool when we disprove things. So I think the extreme cases, as we know, the anomalies are where we want to look. And that's where I wanted to take you next in, in an effort to maybe challenge what you're saying in a way, and at the same time develop some kind of map of what these extended consciousness realms might look like. Because we have to, of course, start with the, the really dopey, we're biological robots in a meaningless universe idea of consciousness, which requires no mapping. <laughs> it requires virtually nothing. But as soon as we acknowledge all the things that you're talking about and saying there's this richness to consciousness, then we have a lot of things to look at. So the first thing that I bring your, so the first point that I bring your attention to is I have to tell my little yoga story, you know, because my very first introduction to yoga was probably similar to the way a lot of people experience it today. And that's through a yoga class, you know, with a yoga mat and postures. But for me, way back in the day, it was on TV. It was this public television station and this woman who was doing yoga and for whatever reason I jumped in the class and did the class with her and I always remember this at the end of the class she goes okay now I want you to lay down close your mind and let the thinking mind subside and let it stop and for just an instant that chatter in my mind stopped well, of course, as a lot of people know, what happens is that scared the crap out of me because yeah. up to that point, I thought that was me. I thought that voice that was constantly yammering on was me, and I thought that that's all there was of me. So that really propelled me into saying, hey, there's something here. There's something I want to look into. But my next kind of venture into it was to start reading books and then eventually start taking classes. And I was taking correspondence classes from the guy who wrote that very famous book, Autobiography of a Yogi, the Yogananda guy who his self-realization fellowship temple is about five miles from where I sit right here, coincidentally. But here I am on this high tech entrepreneur who's trying to get my business off the ground and I'm getting these correspondences from the self-realization fellowship that's walking that's great, though. well it, it's 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 the story that a lot of us have in terms of just how we're, we're, we're led down a path whether we want to or not yep. but here's the point in all that so that's my little story but the point is when you start reading Yogananda and you read the first 30 pages for most of us, especially with any kind of grounding in Western realism, we're blown away by the miracles. I mean, is this guy for real? Talking about, you know, manifesting things, meals right in front of him, by location of people, uh, shape shifting. So this is a real guy. Yogananda, we have pictures of him. We have people who still remember sitting with him, people who recount seeing miracles, maybe not of that magnitude, but what are we to make of the yoga miracles we hear that kind of challenge our understanding of how reality works, but more importantly for our discussion, how consciousness works? Do you have any thoughts on that, Don? Well, I think what I fall back on in my own experience, because I got into all this through theosophy. Actually, you want to hear my experience? I was thinking about this. I don't think I shared this with you. Absolutely. This is pretty amazing. So when I was a kid, my dad used to take us to the local flea market on the weekend. And we'd just look around at all the junk and stuff, right? I was probably, I was in high school, so probably 15 or 16 or something. And one time we were there, and there was a guy with a table set out, and he had all these books, right? And I loved to read even back then. So I went up and looked. They were weird. They were like how to do telepathy and astral projection and all this weird stuff. And the guy just looks at me and goes, I think this one's for you. And he gives me a book on how to astral project. And I'm like, 
that's weird. So we got out to the car to go home, and I like look at the thing. They're like, "What is that?" I'm like, "I don't know, some stupid shit." And I threw it out the window. Literally, just threw it out the window. The irony just never left me because it was only within a year or two after that that I started to have my astro protector. But that's pretty wild, huh? The guy saw it's something. pretty wild, but you got to follow it up with the story of the first astral projection. Oh, seriously? You want it, uh, yeah, I don't know if I ever shared that with you. So, yeah, it was totally spontaneous. I'd come home from school, and I used to take naps when I'd come home from school. I'm laying there taking a nap. And next thing you know, I wake up, and I'm, like, spinning around the periphery of my bedroom, like the wall, the upper wall where the ceiling meets the wall, literally spinning. And I'm like, and I was terrified. And yet at the same time, I, I was like, what is this? My curiosity dominated over the terror. I felt this abject feeling of terror, but I was just like, what the hell is going on? What is going on? What is going on? And then boom, I woke up. That was my first, very first experience. And that happened the second time, and the second time the terror was still there, but it was it had much less of an effect on me because I recognized what had happened. And both of those happened in high school, and I totally forgot about both of them. And then I went away to college, and you know, with college you get into all the fa funny stuff. So I ended up meeting this girl, and she gave me Ledbetter's book about um, astral plane, and. I read it, and he talked about going to this plane next to ours, and, and I just made the connection. I'm like, that must have been what I did in high school. Well, like, somehow I can naturally go there by myself. And me and my bud, my roommate, we set up this little contest. Because, I, you know, he read the book. He was into the stuff, too. And it was like, well, let's even go there first. And we are just, like, whatever. I would practice. He would practice. We'd try to see if we could get back there. And I ended up getting back there pretty quickly. And that was the start of my whole adventure in uh, working with, you know, astral projection or lucid dreaming or whatever you want to call it. So most of that happened when I was in college. And Don, maybe you should point people to the book you wrote. Isn't it How to yeah. OBE? Yeah, Do OBE. Yeah, Do OBE. Yeah, so that's up there with my other book. If you can on dondeg.com, you can download it. And it actually explains the method that I used. It tells exactly how I did it. I developed a, a method that very reproducibly worked really well. And it turns out, in retrospect, it was the same method that Stephen LaBerge described as a wake-induced lucid dream. They were wild, he called it. Exact same method. So back to the question, and I'm sure you've thought a lot about this. What does the reality of that extended consciousness realm that you tapped into, and we can only assume some of these yogis tapped into as well, what does that say more broadly about our understanding of consciousness as we experience it on a day-to-day -day basis? Well, one thing it says is a lot of what consciousness is is invisible to our immediate awareness. We're just not conscious of it, it's unconscious. Yet, it conditions our consciousness. Like I spend a lot of time in the book talking about that. So you might want to use the word filter, right? But these are things that affect how we perceive the world and how we act. And it's also the bait, where, like where do creativity and inspiration and things like that come from, right? These are the currents, the undercurrents in the cave that filter up and affect our day-to-day -day behavior, our moment-by-moment -moment behavior. And, you know, if you think, like, um, you know, I give the example in the book of um, Kekul discovering the structure of benzene, right? And look at the impact that had on the world. And it's, in a way, you might think maybe that's a slow motion example of some of these, what you're calling yogi miracles, right? Maybe these yogis who become, you know, I just presume that in general, they're telling the truth. Of course, there's a bunch of fakers and posers and stuff like that. But this is, there's this it's an ancient tradition that's like lost in the midst of human history. We can't even say how old the yoga tradition is. I find it hard to believe that it would last this long if it was all BS, right? 
So well, well, beyond, beyond that, because I always hate that as an explanation is that because we see so many, so much fakery that does endure for centuries and centuries. The, the other thing I'd point out is that our best uh, science is pointing to these same things. It's not reaching. It is, so when we look at the side lab as flawed as the parapsychology experiments might be in one way or another, they're pointing towards this. If we look at near-death experience science, it's pointing towards this. If we look at experiments with, like we're talking about psilocybin or DMT or with psychedelics, it's pointing towards this extended consciousness realm. So well, your, would, your viewpoint is kind of interesting to me because it's like coy. Like, just say it, it's there, these inner realms. I call them the inner realms, you call them the planes. So you having my start in theosophy, that's one of the first ideas they teach you is that there's these seven planes. And the one we perceive here with our senses and our physical body, the physical plane is just the lowest, the crudest of all of them. And that idea runs through all my writings. And the only major shift that's happened from my earliest, when I wrote Beyond the Physical in the early 1990s to Yogi View of Consciousness, is I quit making the delusional belief that the astral plane is out here. It's not. It's, it's behind here. It's deep. You've got to turn around and go into the astral plane. It's deeper in the mind. It's a deeper level in the mind. Right? So all of these, and so that's what I depict in the... Um, Yoga your consciousness show how these make these progressive screens deeper into the cave. They just exist. There's maps. There's really well established maps. There's no reason to be coy about it. We can sit and debate the value of the various maps. Again, it comes down to people's experiences, right? So, like a lot of people have experienced psychedelic drugs. So that's a decent one. So what that's doing is it's allowing you to see two maps simultaneously, right? You're still in this map, but it's it's like making cracks in the surface, so to speak, and allowing you to see below into the other map a little bit better. That's about what's going on with that. Lucid dreaming is, in dreaming in general, both processes, you're going to the next inner level. When you die, you go to the next inner level. See, what happens when you die is you just you lose this vehicle and you just go deeper into the layers of your mind. Maybe. Hold that thought. So, Don, I know you teach there at Wayne State University in Detroit, and you're from Detroit, right? Yeah. Well, I'm from the suburbs. I always say Detroit just because it's easier. But. Well, I, I'm from the suburbs of Chicago, but I lived in Detroit for a little I, while. As, I've as crossed well. 8 Mile many times. I grew up very close to 8 Mile. So. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Famous uh, M&M territory. Yeah, yeah, I used to live down in... Uh, I think I told you I used to live down in River Rouge for a short period of time when oh, I was wow. in college and I, I, I worked down there. But th the nice thing about both Chicago and Detroit is you develop a natural kind of boost in your immune system to bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, think there's, I think there's less people who are susceptible to the yogic bullshit that uh, a lot of people fall for, you know. So even if you look at all the scandals that are associated with yogis, that are associated with the sage on the stage mentality, which is what a lot of people are going to hear when they hear yoga. They hear you talk about yoga and they're going to go oh, yeah. fake, uh, huckster, and manipulator because a lot of these people have abused what powers they do have. So it's not that they have powers, but they've abused them. So you know, you know, one, of the things, one of the things I say in the book about that is that it's just more proof that pushes you towards real yoga. Well, yes. maybe, maybe, but here's a whole... Here's you see, a, again, it's more of this, the world is just, you know, when you start to realize that the world itself is a bunch of empty promises, just empty promises, and that's another empty promise right there. It's those empty promises that over and over and over again that cause you to turn and just go, what the hell is going on? Well, where is satisfaction? Where is resolution? Here's a counter. Here's a counter argument to that, and it's from Ken Wilber, who many people will know, very accomplished in terms of uh, yoga. Yeah, I mean, he's pretty familiar with Ken Wilber's work. Yeah. What's that? I'm pretty familiar with Ken Wilber's work. So I've been reading it since college. The, the the crux of Ken Wilber's philosophy, or or 
the, the crux of his contribution is this idea of wake up, clean up, grow up. And the idea is that when we look at people who have some abilities to master these extended consciousness realms, these abilities to maybe perfect some of the yoga skills that you're talking about, they go from the 100 pound dumbbell up to the 200, 300 pound dumbbell. And we look at them and we go, wow. And then the next thing you know, we find out that they're screwing every student and they're stealing money and they're doing all the rest of this. And they're going, hey, how can this be? I mean, I, I, the, the, uh, this person put me in samadhi with just a, a look or a touch on the forehead. I know that's real because I experienced it. And, and uh, beyond that, we've put them on such a level because we've said this enlightenment, whatever that means, or this awakening is the ultimate goal of this whole process of yoga. So along comes Ken Wilber and he says, you know what, we need a little Western pragmatism here in the form of cognitive psychology and uh, self-development. We need to say, just because you wake up, does it mean that you've cleaned up? Does it mean that you've dealt with the shadow stuff that we all have just from living a normal life. And it doesn't mean that we haven't grown up emotionally and become more, just more of a responsible person. What do you think about Ken Wilber's idea of wake up, clean up, grow up? And how does that relate to this yogic philosophy that we've been talking about? Yeah, it's his way to say yama and niyama. It expound is. on that right i mean yeah that's what yama and niyama are coming to grips with all your inner demons you can't turn around and go through that bindu and experience the absolute these are magnetic forces that prevent you from doing that don and i am totally i am totally 100 percent with you and i jumped on that right at the beginning because that was always my understanding of yama and niyama but let's deal with the fact that that's not how this has played out in our society right so but that's again that's what i said see when you really start to understand it and if you do like let the niyama and niyama effect take over one of the things that's happened to me is i've just really manifestation it's like the surface of the lake it's the surface of the ocean during a storm it's just all cloudy and crazy and nuts and then you go underneath and it's very calm and quiet and the further down you go the calmer it is it's always a storm on the surface. That's the definition of the surface. Manifestation is always a mess. But here's, so here's, the, here, here's the essential truth. We're not going to change it. We're not going to change it. That's the nature of it. It's always yeah, but, but here's the essential truth that Ken Wilbur has tapped into. And I think it relates back to that wonderful phrase that you turned in there in terms of at least the humanities understand that we live in a culture and that we live in a society as opposed to science who sometimes... You know, I always say the biologic robot in a meaningless universe. It's like, you, you don't really even believe that stuff. So at least humanities raises us out of that. Well, in the same way here, I think what, what Ken Wilber is doing is saying, we've kind of become enamored with this idea of enlightenment, and we've really elevated it to a point, and we fundamentally misunderstood it. So you can then introduce the, reintroduce yama niyama, but don't we have to acknowledge that even the, the, the Hindu culture for hundreds of years, and as it's been brought forward into our culture and meshed with our culture, has fundamentally maybe missed this a little bit. And we can't say everybody has because there's obviously a lot of people who have gotten it, but there's a lot of people who've really... It's, it's actually really interesting what you're asking. It's really interesting and it's complicated. It's historical, right? And part of the way that I respond, the first thing that pops into my head to respond, you notice through the whole of yoga of consciousness, I make no bones about referring to Western civilization as barbaric because it only accepts the world of the senses. It's just barbaric. It's right in your face. It's like hit with a bone or something. You know? It's just barbaric. We're, we're slowly growing out of our barbarism. You know, that's one angle. The other angle is when you look at the manifestation, it's cyclic, right? So there's times of calm followed by times of storm, times of calm followed by times of storm. And 
that's going to happen culturally too, right? So you have the Pax Romana for 200 years and then the Dark Ages where it's just all chaos, right? And so, you know, civilization-wise, you're going to have times of peace and then you're going to have just times of chaos. It's just, it's just the nature of the waves. See, that's really like a key idea that we teach in the Indian philosophy of like of the Maya. The Maya is manifestation and it's made of gunas. And what are gunas? They're waves. That's all that gunas means is wave. And the waves can be of three kinds. They can be uh, like slow, or they can be chaotic, like fire or a storm or a tornado, or they can be harmonious, like a light wave, a sattva. You've got rajas, tamas, and sattva. The more I go, the more convinced I am that that is the fundamental physics of all reality, and that our physics eventually will converge that understanding, because it does explain Everything around us, even the nonlinear dynamics that we're slowly falling into will be our expression and our culture of that basic insight that the Hindus discovered, you know, back in the times of Upanishad, right? However long ago that was. But this basic understanding, that's the nature of the manifestation, which is just one aspect of existence, right? And so here we are in that thing, and it has the power of Maya, of delusion, of, of, of drawing you in, of making you believe it's real, of Taking the being that is our consciousness. Remember, consciousness has the magic power of giving being, giving existence to stuff. And so, you know, hold on, Don. I want to take one more shot at this because where I'm get, where I'm coming from is in the same way that the humanities acknowledge that there is culture, there is society at play. I think what Ken Wilber is tapping into is that we've put this process of awakening slash enlightenment and we've held it to the the goal we, we've put it forth as the goal of this consciousness evolution and what he's calling into question here in a very western barbaric bone on the head kind of way is to say maybe not and that's a contribution that's something different that i think we have to examine and we can say like you're saying well that just got lost and if we go back far enough the yama and the niyama understood it and stuff like that but what does it say that that it it it, it is lost in so many of the yogis that we've experienced over the last hundreds of years hundreds of years who d have achieved some kind of mastery of this extended consciousness and yet haven't grown up and haven't cleaned up. That's the allure of the, you know, in the book, I call it the intermediate zones, which I found from an author on the internet. I can't think of his name right now. I cite him in the book, but it's like everything from here on the screen all the way to the Bindu until you pass through the Bindu, all that whole cave is delusion, all delusion. If you believe any of it, you're deluded. But the thing is, and this is the fundamental process. So this is where I would, I don't know if I'd say argue with Wilbur, but Vanderloo's conception, when you become the absolute, you see there's only one thing going on. The absolute somehow, there's some miraculous process that probably humans will never be capable of understanding, like fans out into manifestation. And manifestation, its purpose is to fold back into being the absolute. And he calls it the rhythm of creation. It's all that exists. It's all that's ever existed. It's eternal. It's never not existed. It's so you're saying don't confuse thing. being halfway out of the cave with being out of the cave. In a nutshell, yeah. In a nutshell. Yeah, and that's the intermediate zone. It's all delusional. Yeah. Blog post for folks. What's up with all that? And, and just bring us up to date on what's going on. In well, yoga. you know, since writing Yogic View of Consciousness, that was um, kind of a, how would you call it, a mind clearing getting all by thinking at that time out on paper. And I, I haven't really been doing anything because I'm in this gestation phase now. I'm looking back at what I wrote. I'm thinking about it. I'm trying to synthesize it at a higher level. I have an idea for a book about the gunas, but these are all very potential right now. So things are kind of quiet on that front. And I really have been very focused on my work stuff, you know, well, teaching and trying to promote the the dynamical theory of cell injury and moving forward. Well, but, you know, I, I think I, I said this in, uh, in my email to you, and I'm definitely going to say it in the introduction, but I'll repeat it here at the end. 
you're a phenomenal, phenomenal thinker. And one of my absolute favorite guests that I've ever had, you know, when I started this show 390 interviews ago or whatever, I always imagined that there were people out there who were truly brilliant, truly revolutionary, who just weren't being heard. And if ever there was an example of someone who fits that, who completely validates the skeptical mission, I think it's you and your work because I... I, That is really nice. I really appreciate that. It's true. I've talked to so many folks who have all these credentials and all these degrees and stuff like that, and you just run circles around them. So it's always so great, so fun. I've taken a long, big turn. Oh, this has been great. I didn't think, I don't know if I told you, I'm actually on vacation now anyway, so this timing of this worked out perfect. So thanks for watching this video. And if it wasn't really a video, but just an audio stored as a video, I apologize. But there's more videos out there as well. But please check out the Skeptico website. You can see it here. We cover a lot of different stuff you might be interested in relating to controversial science and spirituality. A lot of shows up there, over 350 of them or so, all free, all available for download. So do check it out. <music>